This is Audrey Duggan with the Lafayette Historical Society Oral History Project, and today we are talking with Gary Bedsworth on Friday, October 22nd, 2021. Good morning, Gary. (laughs) I have to ask, what is your full name and the spelling, and if you have a nickname? Gary J. Bedsworth. G-A-R-Y. J-A-Y. B-E-D-S-W-O-R-T-H. No nicknames. Okay, great. And how long did you live in Lafayette? How how old were you when you came here? Uh, when I came there, it was, I was in the third grade. Second grade, we went to Vallecito for a couple of years. So I was, whenever you start, I don't know, I was probably the second and third grade. And what year were you born, Gary? What's your birth date? 1939. Okay. And then how long did you live in Lafayette? I lived in Lafayette until I graduated from uh, high school in 1957. And I came back during my first two two, three years of college and uh, worked for my dad. And I worked at the Cape Cod house and a couple of different things between colleges. That's great. Tell me a little bit about your parents and in particular your father and his businesses. Well, in Milton, Los Angeles, uh, at that time, my father was a bartender at Mike Lyman's, I believe. And, um, I'm familiar with some of the names of all the old, some of the old restaurants there, but it was an amazing uh, experience. So I was born in LA and uh, my mom, I don't believe it worked at that time. My dad was a bartender and later on we moved when I was about three years old or about in the third grade. Oh no, I must've been in Oakland in the first grade because yeah, I was, because I was in the first grade there, and I wasn't, in, I wasn't in school in LA, so I would have, yeah. So that kind of changes that time. And right? what what were your parents' names, and and do you um, remember when they were born? Uh, my dad was born in two thousand. Excuse me, one thousand nineteen ten. And my mother was born, I think, in 1918. Okay. And your dad's name? Was J. Actually, it was James Franklin Bedsworth. But his name all his life was J. Bedsworth. He, he was the owner of the Tunnel Inn. He acquired it um, in the 40s. And there were 13 partners. I remember that. And he slowly bought them out. And uh, he came up in the 50s. And at that time, the property was owned by, uh, the building was owned by Gus Swartz. And he, Jay bought the property with a bunch of other people. And he ended up with one partner who was Saul Wiseman. And Saul Wiseman was uh, owned several furniture stores, appliance stores in the uh, in the Oakland area, Oakland, Berkeley, Hayward. So we went on from there. That was in, that all took place during the very early 50s. I, under, I understand that your father had some skills in the, in the area of magic. One of the attractors to the business was uh, his magic show. And I was going through uh, items yesterday that I'm going to ship to the, actually I'm going to ship to my son in in San Ramon and he will take them to the Lafayette Historical Society. And in those, in in those are uh, a number of things that relate to uh, his life at the tunnel and, and his magic. There's a picture of the tunnel in there, several pictures of the tunnel in. And one is of the bar with a stage behind it. 
it was the only restaurant that I can recall uh, that had a stage behind the bar and he performed magic there for some time. Uh, the famous trick was uh, Azra and uh, it's a illusion where my mother would uh, enter the stage and he would do the hypnotic thing and she would lay down on the table and she would raise and now this is in front of the bar you got people sitting about 10 feet from you she would raise uh, into the air about four feet and then he would yank the the um, blanket off uh, her body and she was not there she disappeared and he was famous for that trick the other trick that was renowned and brought a lot of people to the restaurant was the card on the ceiling and uh, he was one of the few people and the few people in the world that did that the trick he would come to your table or be invited to your table and you would uh, he would fan the deck, do some simple tricks and fan the deck and you would select a card. And then he would uh, spread the deck uh, and put your card and you would put your card in the middle and then he would shuffle the cards and mix them up. And then he would wrap them in a handkerchief. And then he would throw the handkerchief and the deck of cards to the ceiling. Oh, and he put it inside the pack uh, that the deck that the cards came out of. And he'd throw it to the ceiling and your card and a dollar bill that you wrapped around the uh, uh, the card case would stick on the ceiling. So one of my... Oh, there, I, I, I have another picture of the dining room with the cards and dollar bills on the ceiling. Uh, pictures from long, long, long ago. So uh, one of my jobs uh, with him was to climb on ladders uh, a couple of times a year and take hundreds of dollars off the ceiling that would go to charity. Did he have a favorite charity? I think he spread it around. Great. Did he ever teach you any of these tricks or did they remain? I was, I was, uh, do, I was doing magic at an early age and I got into my teens and like a lot of teenagers, I found other things to do. Uh, tell me about your family and uh, some of their, their names and ages would be great. Uh, I have uh, a sister, a half sister who passed away. Uh, a number of years ago, and myself, and my mother had been divorced, and she lived with her father part of time, and she lived with us part of time. Uh, so I grew up, grew up mostly as an uh, as an only child. Uh, in terms of my family, my dad's family was from Pleasanton. Oh, I have a son. Yeah, I have a son and and a daughter. And uh, the son is still in San Francisco. Uh, they were born in um, the San Jose area. And he, we have moved to other places, but he's back in California. He's been in the club business for some time. And like my father, uh, who was general manager after the restaurant closed in Crown Hill Country Club, uh, later in life, um, after my dad passed, my son was also a manager at Round Hill Country Club. And then he moved to the South Florida Yacht Club, and he is now the uh, uh, assistant general manager at the uh, Pacific Union Club in San Francisco. How about that? Now, is his name also... Jay His name is also Jay. Jay Bed is it Bedsworth? Yes, Jay Bedsworth. He's the third third generation. Well, what else? What other stories would you like to tell us about your memories related to Lafayette? Well, related to Lafayette, I I just enjoyed uh, growing up there. I enjoyed enjoyed the fact that our first house was uh, 
closer to Oakland, not too far from the two lane road. Actually, it was a, the highway was a three lane road that turned into two lane roads and there was a field between us and the highway. And there were numerous excellent accidents there at that time when the speed was 55 miles an hour, <laughs> a lot different than now. So um, we moved from there. I spent a couple of years at Vallecito and then I moved to uh, Lafayette itself. And uh, I lived there until I graduated from high school. Um, many good memories of friends and outings into the local hills, which uh, had no houses on them then, and even campfires once in a while and overnights and all that stuff um, in our own little uh, utopia there in Lafayette. My next door neighbor was uh, came down from Canada with two other guys to be uh, uh, start a hockey team there in the early 40s. And uh, they started the East Bay Hockey Program. And so I skated and played hockey all the way through high school with the East Bay, uh, with a, the Berkeley Club from the East Bay Hockey League. So that was my, my basic sport. Nice. So that was at the rink over in Berkeley? Yes. And I later went on and we won the intramural champ championship at uh, Michigan State. That's great. Wow. Oh, do you recall where you lived uh, when you lived in Lafayette, the address? Yes, it's on Brook Street. And I don't have the ex, uh, the address at hand. I know what it is. I have it written down, but it's not in front of me. Okay, that's, that's no, no problem. I think it was 3568. What... You've been in Lafayette. You were just here the other day chatting with some folks at the Historical Society. Um, compared to when you were young, what are the biggest changes that you see when you drive into town? Well, the obvious one is traffic, but a lot more, uh, a lot more uh, stores and things are torn, torn down. The, the tunnel in was torn down. The Red Mill... Uh, was torn down because they blocked our freeway entrance. The um, the Cape Cod has been torn down, um, and some of the restaurants. But the whole landscape has changed in terms of population. And I, I think we had about thirty thousand people in the area at that point. And I don't know what's there now. Can you describe where the some of these restaurants were on Tunnel Strip? Well, the signature viewpoint was uh, a huge oak tree uh, in the front of the restaurant. And it was almost in the middle of town. Uh, I don't remember the street that uh, I came up um, to get to it from our house. We were not that far away. But there was a stoplight there, and then you took a left, and then there were a couple of little uh, stores, and then there was the Tunnel Inn, and then there was the Lafayette Fish House, uh, Seafood House, uh, next door to that, and uh, several other things, and as you went up probably 100 yards, there was the Cape Cod. Okay. So it almost seems like it was opposite where the uh, Diablo Foods is, uh, close to that area in there? Could be, but I don't recall the area okay. that well. That's all right. Do you remember um, a place called El Nido Rancho? Absolutely. El Nido Rancho uh, was the operation that after, uh, go back a, a phase, when Gus Schwartz, uh, at the end of my dad's lease on the Tunnel Inn, he wouldn't improve the property it, it was falling apart. It had been there for ages. It needed plumbing work and a whole bunch of stuff. And so my J, my dad um, uh, closed the business. He actually sold it to Pitar. Um, and Pitar was the maitre d' when I first met him at the 365 Club in San Francisco. That's where I took the group for my senior ball. Um, and Pitar 
and bought the tunnel in and ran Pitar's restaurants for many years. So, 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 so was Pitar's restaurant in the structure of? The, yes. Okay, yes, it was tunnel. in that same building. Mm -hmm. That same building, and that now is gone also. Um, so then my dad went to work for a friend of him as for General Mills and as they negotiated to buy El Nido Rancho. So El Nido Rancho, and I have this menu from, well, not a, I have pictures of El Nido Rancho as it was converted to the Red Mill. So that became the Red Mill with something like 30 um, hotel rooms and a dining room and a kitchen and a, bath, a, a banquet room and a pool. So I also lived in that, uh, that little motel for a couple of years. Then I went on to Michigan State. Now, did they um, have, um, so you, uh, so you, do you mostly remember it then as um, the Red Mill? Or, or do you have memories of El Nido Rancho when you were young as well? Well, El Nido Rancho was a landmark that we passed, in, and at that point we turned into Lafayette. So I, I always remember that, um, but I certainly remember the Red Mill because I helped my dad open it. I left... Um, oh, so this was his place then? Yes. Oh, my goodness, I didn't realize that. Okay, yeah, tell, tell us more about that then. Well, the Red Mill, I was uh, going to USC and uh, pre-med wasn't working out for me. So I, I left USC uh, and went to, um, uh, came home and because my dad was opening this place and I, I was always in love with the food business. That's where I originally wanted to go to school for that. So anyway, we helped open it, and it was uh, very successful for for quite a while. Um, and had a nice menu, and I've got the menu, uh, I think, in the box that I'm sending to um, the Historical Society. I believe I put that in there yesterday. I had one. And uh, that was a great experience. And then the chef talked me into going to City College through the culinary program. And then I went to Michigan State and stayed in the business. So I have a menu in front of me now, J. Bezworth Red Mill Tunnel Strip, Lafayette, California. And uh, that's it. That's great. I am looking at a photo of the inside with the red carpeting. It looks like a grand piano and... A beautiful bar, and um, did he continue to do his magic here, or it, did he phase that out, or what? What happened? Well, the magic he did there was um, a little different in that he did most of it at the bar, uh, bar tables, and some in the dining room, but it wasn't f focused as much on magic because he didn't do the ceiling. The ceiling wasn't appropriate for the card trick. I see. All right. Well, so that had a special significance at the tunnel in the card trick. You had mentioned that your father also was in the some Hall of Fame. In some what? Hall of Fame for magic for magicians. Yeah, he's in the, in the magicians Hall of Fame, and um, I talked to the guy that was working on the piece on that uh, several years ago. Uh, and it's it's kind of obscure right now, but someplace in L.A. there's a Magician's Hall of Fame. Um, he also was pretty famous for playing in the Bing Crosby tournament as an invited guest for 14 years. And I have many stories um, and many memories of the, the Crosby tournament and the celebrities that would come into the tunnel in. Oh, what, what was that? The Crosby Tournament? Yeah, the Bing Crosby, which is now the AT&T, has been for decades. Um, the Bing Crosby Tournament at Pebble Beach was an invited guest uh, uh, playing with the pros for for the tournament and the pro-am that they had before that. So he 
they, there's a story. In fact, there's a, I have a newspaper article in front of me uh, about that, where he was called on the phone and the voice said, this is Bing Crosby. And he didn't believe him. And actually what my dad told me, I think he hung up the first time. Uh, <laughs> and, and then Crosby called back <laughs> and uh, said, no, this is Bing Crosby. And that was the first invitation to the, to the golf tournament. And that was in the late um, 50s, 59, probably 58. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it was before that. It was during, it was while I was high school. I take it back. It goes way back. Because I was down to, I, I was at the Crosby tournament with him several times. And I know part of it was in high school because I couldn't drive. Um, and, uh, later, uh, was, uh, the so maybe, 1950s. maybe in the mid fifties. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It would be the mid fifties. Mm -hmm. um, and now uh, you had mentioned, so did people from the tournament come up to your dad's to, uh, well, they knew of the tunnel end because of the magic tricks that, that, uh, Jay would do at the Crosby parties. Mm -hmm. So when I went with him, when I was old enough, um, and I would go to some of those parties and just stay in the background and he would be doing tricks for hours. Uh, cause that was really his special specialty was close up magic at the table with cards and dice mm -hmm. and a bunch <laughs> of stuff. Wow. And I'm sending this article also to the, um, society. Okay. That's, That's got a picture in the whole thing. And it, it has this history from when and how he took up magic. Now, what did uh, what did you do uh, for a living, Gary? I, uh, the chef at the, at the Red Mill, uh, talked me into going to City College of San Francisco after three years of, of two years at Oregon State, one, one, one at USC. Um, to go to a culinary program because they had a good one. They had European chefs teaching at that point. Oh. And when I graduated from um, City College, I then went on to Michigan State because there were only a few four-year colleges in the United States at that time that specialized in hotel and restaurant management. So I graduated from... Uh, Michigan State in 64 and spent my whole life and basically my whole life in the in the restaurant business. I spent 10 years in restaurants and then I was hired away from that from people that were starting a hospital food service management company. And I told them, you're nuts. No way I'll work in a hospital. I'm a restaurant guy. Yeah. <laughs> but I came to understand that their whole motivation was to take over hospital food service and make it good. And with my background in fine dining and, and chef training, and then my management of uh, uh, large restaurants, um, it worked perfectly and I helped develop that company. What happened with our little company called Service Direction was that it was it caught the, the, the highlight from Service Master, which is it was a big company, and Service Master bought us as the um, hospitality arm of uh, uh, Service Master, and so I spent a um, I, I spent another ten years with with uh, Service Master. Do you have any additional stories that you would like to share today? Well, another honor that my dad had is he had a hole named after, he played a lot of golf. I mean, he was a magician, restaurateur, and golfer. Um, and he was an uh, invited member of the Hillsdilly in Denver uh, for many years. And he became Mr. Hillsdilly, and we have a, he had a hole named after him. And my son has the flag from that hole. Um, and to be named in a, in a fairly famous golf tournament, to be named a uh, whole named after you is pretty not nice, pretty honor. And I have in front of me a, 
a um, program from Game and Gossip in 1959 from the Crosby Tournament. As I said, I haven't oh. seen these in a long time. So he played a lot of golf. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's great. All right. Well, um, let's just see here. I think that um, that's been uh, wonderful to hear about all these stories and um, about your father and about you and about your son, uh, three generations of... It, my son and I both learned a lot from my father. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot from him and and my son learned, my son lived with him for a couple of years while he was going to school. And he also learned a lot from him. So, Did your father have any um, guiding principles related to that type of business? No, there's a few things that, that I remember. Uh, one thing, he virtually never passed a person in the street without giving them money. Mm -hmm. He was always, because he grew up poor. He left school early and uh, left Pleasanton early and worked as a dishwasher and pantry man and didn't have an education and became very successful. I think uh, working with the public was important and the fact that uh, you are not the king of the hill. You're serving people that pay your bill and um, everybody is equal, even in those days in my dad's mind. And that may be because he worked in so many jobs around that he worked with people of different color and different races, and he understood that we're all alike. All right. Well, I think that's about all the questions that I had for you today. And, um, well, thank you so much, Gary. And uh, you. you have a great day. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Bro. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye.